I taught my talk, uh, Visual Studio Code Sparks Joy. Um, I guess ever since I started using Visual Studio Code, I kind of held it up. I was like, this, this one sparks joy. I looked at Sublime Text and I said, thank you for your service and neatly threw it out the window. Um, and I thought about why uh, I talk about Visual Studio Code and why I talk about it now. Um, and Visual Studio Code is becoming incredibly popular. Uh, I noticed on the Stack Overflow survey for 2018, it was number one uh, editor for developers and it had 35% out of 80 something thousand uh, votes. And then 2019, I just saw that it's up to 51%. Uh, so I thought this would be an interesting talk to uh, give to people who are kind of new, newer to Visual Studio Code. If you're more, if you use it every day like I do, uh, I'm not sure you'll gain any like super keen insights. Maybe there'll be one or two kind of things that might, you might be like, oh, I've never seen that before. But mainly this is for people who are switching over from something else, maybe another IDE or another editor. And I um, uh, just thought I'd put this together for people like that. And if you look at Google, Google Trends for the past five years, uh, Visual Studio Code came out in April of 2015. You can kind of see the blue line, how it's kind of trajected all the way up. Uh, so that's kind of interesting for a Microsoft product. They've kind of gotten over the hump of, oh, Microsoft hasn't come out with anything cool since Windows XP. Uh, you've got Visual Studio Code, it's doing a lot of cool things, it got a lot of cool features coming. And uh, I do most of my development uh, in JavaScript. I work for Warner Media, uh, I guess AT&T um, and HBO. Um, uh, with the content supply chain, which basically means that anything you see on your TV has to come through anything that we've done. Uh, so I suppose I have to apologize for season eight of Game of Thrones. Uh, <laughs> um, on behalf of the company, I guess I can do that. Um, <laughs> and for the dark episodes, there actually was some talk about the quality control around that episode. Uh, before it came out, something the way they filmed it, it really wasn't something they could fix right away, but uh, there you go, that's a disclaimer. <laughs> and um, I'm gonna do most of my talk inside of Visual Studio Code, even though I have a, like a resources slide at the end. Um, uh, and I'll start here with the welcome page. So when you start Visual Studio Code, can anybody read this? Is this font too small? Better? <laughs> I don't know if I can make it better. I can definitely make it bigger. Um, <laughs> when you first uh, download uh, Visual Studio Code, it's, it's free, it's open source, it's uh, lightweight. It is an editor, it's not an IDE like IntelliJ, um, but it does have IDE like features. Um, it's really good for, um, Things like JavaScript, uh, Python, uh, C Sharp, C++, uh, Ruby, uh, other languages like that. And it gives some really cool features. It's really fast. Uh, I liked it more than using Sublime or Atom uh, or, or IntelliJ where I can actually type a letter and it shows up immediately. That's something I like when I'm, when I'm working. And um, when you first open up Visual Studio Code, you will get this welcome page. And at the bottom uh, left-hand corner, it does have a check check box to show you this welcome page but before you turn that off there are a couple of interesting things here uh, to make note of first is the interface overview uh, if you don't know what any of the icons mean uh, this interface overview will tell you what all those icons mean uh, what everything on the bottom means and that's a really good uh, quick overview um, and also if you're coming from a different editor such as uh, vim or sublime and you're used to different key bindings uh, Visual Studio Code provides uh, what they call key maps. So if you click on the settings and key bindings here, uh, you can it will search the marketplace, which has all the extensions, and it will show you key maps for uh, all the other editors out there. And if you're used to using Vim key bindings, you can install something like that. Atom, Sublime Text, Visual Studio, you can install those so that when you start using Visual Studio Code, you start from a place that's way more familiar than having to learn all the key bindings over again from scratch. And once you have all the key bindings set up, um, at the bottom here, a really neat feature they have inside of Visual Studio Code is this interactive playground. And here, um, if you've never read through it, I suggest reading through it. What's cool is it gives you like a mini editor around some of the features you can read about. And you can um, do different things just by uh, messing around in these small editors. You can multi-select and do all that stuff and learn how to do anything like that. Uh, right here inside of the uh, interactive playground, um, it talks about IntelliSense, it goes on and on about other things we'll talk about in a second as well. 
And if you don't know anything about Visual Studio Code, I think the most important thing you'd want to know about is the command palette. And down here it says find and run all commands, but really that's uh, using the command palette. If you've ever used Sublime Text, it's uh, pretty much the same thing. If you hit Shift Command P on your keyboard, uh, if you're on a Mac, you will get this command palette, which is all of the different commands you have. Uh, you can do anything from here. And it'll also show you the key bindings associated with those as well on the right if you need to uh, trying to memorize some key bindings. And also at the bottom left down here, there's like a printable keyboard uh, cheat sheet, which is like a PDF you can download and print out if you really want to get uh, deeper into it and learn more. Uh, you can do that there as well. And so if you don't remember anything else, just remember that the command palette is, is really useful for anything. If you want to think about how to do something, you can just hit uh, Command Shift P and then type in what you want and it'll search and you can use that. And of course, um, like any editor, it has themes. If I click here, it shows all the themes I have installed and then there's some that come by default. Um, if I go up and down, it switches pretty quickly between uh, some of the other themes I have downloaded. I have Material, uh, I use Dracula myself. There's a whole bunch of other ones you can pick. It's up to you. Um, what you want to use, um, or you can make up your own theme if you'd like to. If you really want to get deep into it, you can make up your own theme. And if you click on this button here, this is for the extensions here. And if you just type in theme, you will get uh, from the marketplace all the different themes that are there. There's this winter is coming theme. I haven't seen that before, but it's got 1.1 million downloads, so it's probably pretty good. And then also after that, I've got some notes here just in case I do get lost. Uh, over here. Um, on top of that, the last thing I'll talk about is if you want to get rid of all the distractions, Visual Studio Code has a Zen mode. So if I open up the command palette and type in Zen, uh, it will get rid of all the menus and the, uh, all the other stuff. And you can just focus in on what you want to focus on. Um, I don't actually use Zen mode at all, but it's something neat to mention. If people uh, feel like they want to focus, get some deep work done, uh, that is totally there for them to do. Uh, let's see what I want to talk about next. All right, um, I've actually written a really small application uh, to show off some of the Visual Studio Code features. It's a little bit easier to actually show things in code. And I've written a really um, silly app, which is an emoji password generator. And I'll start it up real quick from my uh, iTerm here. And basically, you can give it a length, and it will give you uh, a password of whatever length you may put in with just emojis. Uh, a really simple uh, view front end and an express back end just for whatever drooling face emoji password thing here. Um, <laughs> and from here, uh, I, I started that up in my iTerm just using uh, an NPM script uh, I have in my package.json. However, uh, a cool thing about uh, Visual Studio Code is it has an integrated terminal. And so you don't necessarily need to switch back and forth between an external terminal and Visual Studio Code. If you hit Command tilde, it will open up the integrated terminal. And from here, you can do anything you would like. Uh, you can add more terminals, and they'll show up in this drop down right here. And you can trash those as well. Uh, you can open up side terminals with a Command slash. You can have terminals open up side by side if you'd like. And from here, I can run my NPM script if I want. Um, and it will just open that back up for me, just like that, no problem. And um, I think that's really cool. It, it keeps me focused in what I'm doing. I don't need to think about what other uh, program I can use. And you can set up your terminals so they, like mine is for Bash, but you can use ZSH or anything you want. You can set it up to be whatever terminal you'd like. You can change the colors. You can change the background. Um, you can change all the settings for pretty much anything in this program. Yeah, go ahead. It will, yeah. It's just like a, any other running terminal. Just just happens to be integrated with this. And so I started my app running uh, my NPM script. But what's another really cool thing uh, I think a lot of people don't necessarily know about is that Visual Studio Code has a task runner built into it. And so if you open up the command palette and type in task, you can see here it has run task, configure task, terminate task. 
If you click on configure task, it will automatically find any NPM scripts you have in your projects package.json and show them here. And it'll also work for any type of uh, scripts you might have, bash scripts, make files, uh, grunt tasks, gulp tasks, anything like that. Uh, I think by default, it will just find NPM grunt and gulp things, but you can custom put on any task you'd like. And if I click on this NPM start, it opens up this task.json file here and over in my uh, in my project here it creates this .vs code folder and it has a task.json file which will have all the tasks I want to have and then it'll have a type of script and it just automatically sets it up for me and so I can run that task uh, from the command palette just by hitting uh, task again and see run task and hit enter and I can go down to npm start and it will start that task for me uh, once the server is up and running, uh, just like that, um, which is a really cool way to run tasks without having to uh, open up a new terminal because it opens up another terminal, which is specifically for tasks uh, on the side as well. Um, and if you decide to terminate that task, it will it can keep it open and use it for that task if you decide to restart it. Or if I hit another button, it'll just close it automatically. And uh, of course, you can go even further with this and you can bind keys to your tasks. So if you're using the command palette again and you type in, uh, let me see, open keyboard shortcuts, I just typed in key, um, it will show all of my uh, key bindings here by default. And then if you look in the upper right hand corner, there's this open curly bracket, close curly bracket, because everything in Visual Studio Code is based on JSON files. So this will open up the key bindings.json file which will show my custom key bindings. Uh, not the default ones, but this will overwrite anything that's by default. So I have all default except for this one, where I gave it the command uh, run task from the work workbench.action, and I give it the argument npm start, and I just made it command n and then command s. And so from here, if I just type in those two commands, it will run um, that task for me just like that, and it's really easy to remember. And I find it really useful for running tests or running ESLint or something like that. Uh, I can just run that without having to really think about um, going to another terminal, running NPMT to run my tests or anything like that. So I find that really useful and it opens up the same terminal it did before, it's just a faster way of doing that. And then there's another uh, way of running NPM scripts as well. If I go back to the settings, um, there is a npm explorer, uh, npm script explorer here up at the top here. And if you enable this uh, explorer for npm scripts, it will find your npm scripts and put down here on the bottom, uh, if you can see this, this uh, extra window down here. If you click this, it will have all your npm scripts from your package.json file. And then I want to run the start command. I could just hit play here and it will run that for me. If you don't want to um, bind it to a key, you can just hit that play for any kind of uh, NPM scripts you have here, and it will run that for you um, just like that. And now that I've kind of gone over uh, some of the cool things you can do with tasks, um, of course, any editor um, would be great to have uh, linting capabilities in Visual Studio Code. And since I work in JavaScript, I use ESLint. So there, of course, is an extension for ESLint. If I search in the marketplace for ESLint, um, you can see here it's probably the most downloaded. It's got 22, almost 22 million downloads. And I won't go into how to set this up exactly. I have a link in resources that'll help you get this set up. But basically, to cut a long story short, you need an ESLint.rc file. Um, if you set up your ESLint and run init, you can set up this file. And if you are, uh, check this into uh, source control, you can share this uh, with people who are working on your project. And once you have this all set up um, and you have the ESLint extension, uh, you will gain all of the uh, linting features um, that goes along with uh, ESLint. So if I just put in a variable here that's not, uh, being used by anything. Uh, if I mouse over it, it tells me it's assigned a value but never used. And down here in the bottom left-hand corner, it will have errors and warnings. Um, and of course here it says it's assigned a value but never used. 
and if I uh, click on this little light bulb, sometimes you can fix uh, an error here, but with this one you can't really fix it other than just getting rid of it. Um, and also you may see, this is unrelated to linting, but if you have some uh, feature, maybe this ES6 that you're not quite using, and you see that light bulb, it may try and fix uh, some code you have. So if I was using promises, it can actually convert promises over to async await for you. If it notices that, oh, you can run this with, you know, async await, just convert it for you, um, which is another cool thing. If you ever see a light bulb, I'd suggest clicking on it because it has some useful things there as well. And um, of course there's linting, but on the other side of linting there's code style. Um, and for JavaScript, I like to use a program uh, called Prettier. Um, who, how, who many people have heard of Prettier before? Um, so there, of course, there's an extension for Visual Studio Code for that. And once you install that, uh, you can have it format your code um, right there for you with quick short uh, keyboard shortcuts. Or you can do it when you save a file. Uh, so for, for instance, if I'm on my index.html and I have some rules about how I want my code to be um, formatted, I can easily, oops, I can easily, like if I'm writing this, I may end up making it one line like this. But of course I've got, I only want my width of my characters to be 100 or 80 or something like that. And if I save this file, I have um, my editor change all my code while I save it. So it works for HTML, it works for JavaScript, JSX, um, etc. And that way I don't have to think about what my code looks like, even though semantically it's correct. I want it to actually look, look look well. I mean, I work with people who have crazy Boolean statements that go out to like 200 characters, and I think it's I think it'd be something really cool to have across your project where you can say, okay, everybody install Prettier, all of our code will look the same, and it won't be like horrendous for certain people who like to who don't really care about necessarily what it looks like. Um, so that's a really interesting and useful uh, extension here as well when it comes to styling your project. Okay, and then um, after that, what was I going to talk about? Uh, debugging. Of course, uh, one of the cooler features, uh, probably what I like the most about Visual Studio Code, it has an integrated no debugger, and also you can uh, debug in Chrome or Firefox or Edge from Visual Studio Code. And so if I go back to <coughs> my, uh, not running, if I run my uh, project again, and, you know, I can generate passwords up to 15, but you notice that anything above five, it seems to just generate five. So there's a bug I put in my code. Um, so we're going to go ahead and try and debug that. So anything less than five, it seems to work just fine. Uh, anything over five, it doesn't seem to be working quite so well. So in Visual Studio Code, if I... Um, want to put in a breakpoint, I can do that. And from the left-hand side here, they have this little bug with an X through it. And you can see uh, this is the debug menu, um, similar to any other debugger you've ever used um, here. And at the top here, there's this gear. You want to click that to get your configurations. And down at the bottom uh, right-hand corner, there's an Add Configuration button. And you can click here, and then for Node.js, you can attach to a process, you can launch programs, do things like that. Uh, for my, my stuff, you'd want to attach to a process, and it'll add to this launch.json file, which will be inside of your VS Code folder, all of the different um, debugging um, configurations um, in your project, which, of course, you can share with people as well. Um, and I already have one set up. I've named it. Um, just debug node, and it'll pick a running process for me. So if I click on that debugger again, and in this uh, little tiny drop-down window here, I can see like this debug node. I have some other configurations already set up, but if I hit play, uh, I can attach this node process here. And I can put a breakpoint here on my post route for generating a password. And if I go back here to my password generator and hit generate, It'll stop right here where I put the breakpoint. And you can also do different things with these breakpoints as well. You can have it stop on an expression. Uh, you can have it stop on a hit count. Uh, you can have it log a message when it hits that breakpoint uh, and things like that. 
And of course you can step through, it gives you all of your uh, expected um, debugger functionality. You can mouse over things and see what they should be. Uh, if I step forward, I can see the length is eight. Um, there's a call stack, you can have a watch list if you wanna watch anything here. Um, and there's also a debug terminal um, as well down here, debug console from here. You can also get um, IntelliSense, which is also really cool for Visual Studio Code, which will give you all of the documentation and code auto-completion inside of Visual Studio Code, which is really handy. And there are other extensions as well for different languages to bring in more IntelliSense features for different languages. Um, but by default, it comes with like TypeScript, JavaScript, and React, I believe, um, already built in. And so if I uh, step into this generate password function, um, I can see what's happening really quickly. It's like whenever the length is greater than or equal to five, it just sets the length to five. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and continue. And I go back here and of course it's still five rather than being eight. So I can go ahead and get rid of all of this uh, and save my, my uh, file here and then I can attach again if I want to check to see if this works or not. Um, go back and generate eight this time. Uh, go through, uh, generate the password, check the length is eight, and then it's going to um, return a password that's eight characters long. So this time we see that it's working uh, without much of a problem. And then up here you can detach from the process that has like a little socket uh, if you want to disconnect from the process. And from here uh, I can see now it's working with 10 or 15 or any number between 1 and 15 uh, seems to have fixed that bug here. And as I was saying with IntelliSense before, it, it's really cool. Like say if I wanted to send back an error if my length is something that's not a number, um, I can always uh, put in maybe if the type of the length is not a number, um, maybe I'll send a response back, but I want to send a status code with it or a status. So if I hit response dot, it will give me a whole bunch of different options I can pick. Uh, I'd want status. And here it tells me what should go inside of uh, the, the arguments here and the parameter should be a number. So I'd send back like a 400. And from here, uh, it tells me that, oops, want to send it. Um, and the body can be anything. But if you mouse over, um, the actual function call here, you'll, it'll say it sends a response and it gives some examples. Uh, so you don't have to go searching through documentation just to see what examples you can use. Uh, you can just kind of look here. If you kind of already know what you're looking for, you've got uh, access to it right here. So length uh, to be a number. And you can do uh, things like that with the um, IntelliSense. And also if you're working in in larger code bases, there's also ways to look at, say, what this function does uh, and go to the definition. So if I right click on this, I can peek the definition of this uh, function here and it'll open up like a little window inside of the file that I'm in, even though this function is in another file and it can show me exactly what that function does already. Um, you can do the same for um, maybe even more built in functions. Um, uh, this one is just part of the node modules, but um, for bigger code bases, this is really useful. And as well, you can uh, right click and go to definition, but if you hold down command uh, key, uh, all of these will be links. And so I can basically command click this and it will open up the file and jump to that function already. So if you need to jump through multiple functions, it makes it very easy to keep jumping through um, all of these functions. Um, in one project and uh, it makes a really useful IDE type feature for uh, JavaScript or any other type of language like that. And another cool thing that comes baked in with Visual Studio Code is it has Git integration or any type of source code integration here. Um, on this left hand side this icon here is for the source control and here I can see the changes I've made to fix that bug. And so if I click on this file here, it'll show me the diff between what the file was and what it is now. Um, and I can choose to um, stage that change for commit. I can go to this other file and look at this as well. Um, another cool thing is you can do it directly from the actual file. On this left-hand side, you see it's got this green um, 
stripe which means that I've actually added code and then um, on this function I remove some code but it has this little red arrow here in the side here and when you click that it'll show you what uh, got removed and if for instance I add uh, another line um, just because um, and I go back um, say I go back here I can commit you know just this one file uh, stage it for for changes and then I can also you know go down here and see what I've changed here um, I put this here and and done that and then I can stage this entire file for commit if I've got separate lines um, I can actually end up changing just this just the line I could commit stage for changes just the line I would want to um, if you click on the side you can just uh, stage only those lines which is kind of useful instead of actually just staging the entire file when you only want to say like okay I'm just, I only care about this small piece of code here so if I add both of those I can just say remove bug up here for the commit message uh, you can hit this check to um, finish the commit it's got a whole bunch of other features where you can uh, once you got it hooked up to github or uh, GitLab or anything like that. You can pull, uh, you can sync it, you can check out, you can make branches, you can um, do stashing, you can do a whole bunch of other things like that as well if you don't necessarily care about um, dealing with the terminal and dealing with all the git commands directly from the terminal. If you're doing just some simple commits, uh, I find it really useful just to do it straight from Visual Studio Code so I don't have to uh, switch back and forth between the terminal and, and deal with all of that. And seeing the diff inside of Visual Studio Code is really useful. Uh, there's other ways and other uh, extensions that offer better diffing tools as well. Um, I think I put some of those in the resources like Git Tree Compare is really really useful for comparing uh, one branch to what you're currently working on as well. And uh, yes, another really good um, extension I have here is called Annotator. Uh, a lot of people use one called Git Lens for doing git blame uh, but I don't really like it because it's a little bit distracting it's got a ton of downloads but let me see if I can see where it shows what it does I don't know if you can see this but down maybe not down here it's kind of putting the actual like per line blame so like as you go through the lines it will tell you who wrote that line it's kind of distracting for me so I actually like to use annotator and if I just um, mouse over and, and select these lines and I open up the command palette and type in annotator I can actually see per line who wrote what line without actually having it there all the time um, so I like using annotator more than more than git lens uh, for that for that functionality but like I said there's plenty of other extensions out there to boost up your git workflow um, and makes it really easy to use it within Visual Studio Code. Let me think how much time I got left. All right. And another interesting thing about Visual Studio Code is, is workspaces. And if you're working on a project where maybe there's two different repos for a front end and a back end, you may want to work across all of them all together, and that's where workspaces really comes together. Uh, workspaces is basically just a bundle of folders or, or uh, projects that you want to add if you go to file you can hit uh, add folder to workspace and you can add uh, any folder you would want to a workspace it's it's not it doesn't really matter how you want to do it but the cool features you get with workspaces is that you get per workspace settings and you can get per workspace extensions so if I go back to the uh, settings menu here I can see I have commonly used settings for a user but for a workspace I can change the tab size for workspace, I can change um, the font, I can change the background color, I can change themes and things like that per workspace. And even at work I've got a React a repo that uses two for tab sizes and then of course the back end uses four. Um, so I can have a workspace that just switches that to two because normally I use four for everything else. And it's a really big pain in the ass if you're not using a workspace because you have to change your spaces every time you open up that folder. Why not just make a workspace that has the settings you want for that project right there for you and like I said you can also have extensions open up per workspace so if I just see what uh, extensions I have here uh, annotator for instance this uh, gear down here I can manage it 
and you can disable it per workspace. So if I click this and disable this for this workspace, it requires a reload. But if I just opened up Visual Studio Code by itself, uh, that extension would, would be on. But however, if I open up this workspace, uh, that extension would be off. Um, I've also got stuff here for React, and if I'm not doing a React project, I might as well disable that extension as well, just cut, out, cut, out, cut down on some overhead as well. Um, so going back to uh, the debugging as well, um, say I'd want to debug perhaps what's on my front end. I'd said I have a tiny view app here. Um, normally, I think a lot of people, when they have something on the front end, they want to debug it. Uh, they might put in a debugger statement here, and then when they run that, um, they would, it would just end up running uh, inside of their uh, Chrome, just like this. When you hit your debugger statement, that's you know all great. Um, but you can actually uh, debug um, through Chrome, through Visual Studio Code. And like I, I mentioned before, you can do it for Chrome, uh, you can do it for Firefox, you can do it for Edge, there's different uh, extensions here. But this one, Debugger for Chrome, is really useful. Um, and before, um, I mentioned when you click on this debugger here, you click on the gear, you get your different uh, tasks that you want. And I have one here for debugging Chrome, but if you add configuration, you have uh, Chrome, uh, and you'd want to attach it. And you can give it uh, a URL uh, down here. I give it the URL I want it to open. I can disable network cache. There's a bunch of other um, settings as well. Um, and I give it the root uh, of my uh, uh, HTML and index and everything like that. And from here, uh, say if I wanted to see uh, this generate password function, I can put a breakpoint here, um, debug Chrome right here. And then when I run this, it will open up a separate Chrome window um, and it will, since I have uh, it call this generate password function when uh, my view app is created, it will already stop here and uh, allow me to debug just as I would for Node um, right inside of Visual Studio Code. This is a separate window, but if I, you know, generate another one, it will go ahead and stop here as well um, and give me the same. Uh, same debugging experience as you would it, as you would have in Chrome already, um, just all in one place. If you want to be a little bit more efficient about it, and um, if you wanted to run, like if you want to debug Node and debug Chrome at the same time, you can also do that as well. Uh, at the top here, there's the gear again. Uh, at the bottom, you can create a compound um, configuration. So if I've already got these two configurations, one for Node and one for Chrome. I can actually combine both of them together with this compound configuration. Uh, I just give the names of the things I want it to run. And uh, I go up here again, and I click on that configuration, which I just named Debug Chrome Node. And if I hit play on that and I attach it to the node process, um, it will, uh, you can see up here in the this little thing, uh, drop down window for the debugging controls. Uh, I can switch between Node and I can switch between uh, Chrome uh, anytime I want. And since I already have uh, a debugger on my generate password, um, you can see that it's already jumped over to Node and it first stopped in my first index.js, which was already in Chrome. So I can debug across my entire stack um, easily just straight here in, in Visual Studio Code, which is useful if you have a bug and you don't necessarily know exactly where it might be. You can put breakpoints across uh, your project and have it stop in, in different places, which uh, I think is really cool, um, super useful. And so I don't have to put a debugger statement in my index, open up Chrome, run it, and then have another process running for Node and debug it that way. I can just do it all in uh, Visual Studio Code, and um, it's all good. Um, so I talked about ex uh, workspaces. Let me see how much time I'll, other time I have but 10 minutes. I've got a few other interesting things I could mention. Um, if, for instance, I'm on uh, a terminal, uh, perhaps I want to uh, open up code from a terminal, uh, there is a shell command. Um, I can open up 
just using like the keyword code, I can open up Visual Studio Code that way. And to get that set up, um, if I go back to the command palette and you just type in the word shell, it will install the code command in your path in your uh, bash profile for you, or you can uninstall it if you don't want it. Uh, just makes it very easy for you to do that. So if you're in a terminal and you want to open up a folder, you can just type code and open up any file or folder that you'd want to open up just like that. And let's see, uh, another cool thing uh, with Video Studio Code is if I go to, say, a really long file, I don't know exactly what line I want to go to, but I know I want to scroll to it. This is about as fast as I can scroll normally, but if you hold down Alt, you can do uh, a really, really fast scroll. Um, I only just found out about this, actually. <laughs> I told somebody about it and they didn't believe me, but you can actually set the speed uh, for um, this is fast scrolling. If you go in the settings, you can search for maybe scroll. Yeah, fast scroll sensitivity. So I have it set to 10 times as fast as normal scroll, but I think by default it starts at 5. Um, that's an interesting thing if you actually don't know where you want to go, but you know, like, you know it's somewhere in the middle. You can hold Alt and get there really quickly. Um, also, I've talked about the command palette, uh, which is Command Shift P. But if you just hit Command P, that will open up a quick launcher for opening up files, uh, and you can just type in the name of the file and go to it um, very easily. But if you uh, open up Command P for the quick file opener, you can also use your arrows to go up and down. And if you hit your right arrow on any of these that you have highlighted, it'll open up those files in the background without you having to reopen. Um, without you having to reopen, type it in, reopen, type it in, reopen, and type it in. Um, that's another interesting uh, thing as well. And uh, yeah, another cool thing I haven't talked about yet is snippets. Um, I think by default Visual Studio Code comes with snippets for JavaScript and maybe React. Uh, and there are different extensions for different snippets as well. I think I have some installed for React, uh, extra ones for JavaScript. Um, if you've never used snippets before, um, it just shorthands uh, a lot of uh, boilerplate you may need to build, like I want to build a React component really easily. Um, with that one extension I have for uh, React, uh, RCC is one for making a class component. Um, if I want to see all the snippets, I can open up the command palette, uh, just type in snippets, um, insert, and then you can see all the ones that are installed currently. I have a ton installed. Um, just like that, really easy, something to learn makes it much easier. Um, another cool thing with Visual Studio Code is it comes with uh, Emmet installed with it. Um, how many people know what Emmet is or have used it before? Okay, so Emmet is kind of like snippets for HTML, CSS, XML, um, SCSS, things like that. So normally if I'm in JSX or working in um, HTML, I might make a div. Oh, I want to make an unordered list. I want to have uh, five of these LIs. Uh, with Emmet, it kind of gives you shorthand language to do all of that uh, by default. So I can make a div. Uh, if I want to give it an ID of app, I can then say, OK, I want now an unordered list, give it a class of list. Uh, say I want five LIs, so do LI times five, give that a class of item. Inside there, I maybe want uh, a link, I uh, can do that, and it'll just pop all that out for you, and it will put your cursor right where you would expect uh, to have your stuff. Um, and I highly recommend learning some Emmet. It's actually really cool. Um, makes it very fast for generating markup. Um, and it comes built into Visual Studio Code. You can wrap text and then have it generate markup around that text and other cool things like that. Um, so yeah, that's another thing that kind of blew my mind when I learned about it. Um, I use it all the time. And let me see what else I've got. Uh, font ligatures. That's a cool thing, um, depending on the font you have. Um, right now I have a font called Fira Code. Uh, Fira Code here is the font family I'm using. And font ligatures are, so you have in code different uh, normal um, commands or symbols like triple equals, double equals, and by default they'd be separated 
into three different characters with font ligatures it will combine all of those down into one uh, character um, so like an arrow would actually look like an arrow um, and it really depends you have to have a font that will support uh, font ligatures however uh, Fira code is free and open source uh, so you can go ahead and download it um, here if you just search for Fira code on github you can already download it and you can see the font ligatures uh, here um, like a triple equals ends up looking like this, not equals arrows and things like that. So if I go back into um, my Visual Studio code and I go back under the user settings, if I go to the top and search for ligatures, um, I can enable and disable them here. And if I go back here, um, I can already start typing in ligatures. Like a triple equals becomes uh, this symbol. Um, an arrow function becomes that. If you have a single arrow, it ends up looking like that. Uh, maybe it's greater than or equal to, or less than or equal to. Uh, that's totally a preference up to you. How, if you like font ligatures, it's something you can use. Um, I personally don't, but a lot of people <laughs> like using it. They see it, they're like, oh, that's the coolest thing. I have to have it. Um, I suggest getting Fira code. It's, it's free. Um, it's a nice looking font. I use it normally anyway. And um, getting font ligatures is, is, you know, something you can do. And I don't think I have much else. Uh, oh, yeah, you can hide this feedback smiley down here. If you wonder what this is for, it's just for giving feedback via Twitter. And <laughs> if you've never clicked it, you just wonder what it is, you can just kind of uh, get rid of it forever. Uh, so I don't really use Twitter that much, but you can get rid of that. That's another thing. Um, yeah, and I think that's probably about all I'm going to cover. Um, if you guys have any questions, you can uh, shoot them at me right now. Uh, I've got a list of resources here if you want to take a picture of this. Uh, my name is Craig Rodriguez. Uh, that's my email, first name at my first name, last name .com. It ends with an S, um, not with a Z. I will post this in the uh, speaker slides um, with the links and everything so you don't have to like try and type out these links. Um, and I'll, I'll put it somewhere and probably within the next hour. Um, that's it.